started a series on, in, named it an introduction to God. You know, people will say that, you ever hear somebody say, you've got to build a relationship with the Lord. And um, somebody might say, well, who am I relating to? And so that was the issue with God and mankind after the fall. You know, in the beginning with Adam, all the Lord ever did with him was walk with him and talk with him, right? It says in the cool of the day in the garden, he'd walk with him and talk with him. And it wasn't a garden like we'd have at our house or, or even a garden like, uh, you know, at a farm. I mean, this was massive, massive, massive square miles of, of Garden of Eden. It was, it was huge. And he would walk with them and talk with them. And um, after the fall, that was the problem. Corruption came in, and the Bible says the, uh, a man's heart is wicked continually. It says that it's, uh, nobody has a, a heart after God. Nobody seeks God. And so when you see scriptures like that, nobody seeks God. God had th that in mind when he started introducing himself to them. He'd come and he would visit them. He'd come during their problems and even during some, you know, good times and he would introduce who he is to them. And that's the thing. He gives us titles for who he is throughout the Old Testament in order to, um, so we can build a relationship with him in that way, in that goodness. We already, you know, seen that um, he's Elohim, right, in the beginning, Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and that word uh, God, Elohim, was given. And then we saw Yahweh in, with Abram in um, uh, Genesis <clears throat> and 12. He says I, to, God, to Abram, I am the uh, God Almighty. I'm the Lord Almighty. And so we see that he is Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, now, Elohim is a, a God who wants to make covenants with mankind. A covenant is more than a contract. It's similar, but it's, it, it's, it's so much better. Um, a covenant is always in blood. In fact, the word covenant itself means to cut until blood flows. There's a lot of times, you know, demonic forces are wanting our youth to cut themselves. They're cutters, right? They, they, they cut on their selves and, and cause blood. Uh, that's a demonic influence. They got a devil. That's a demon um, that, that does that. That's why even demonically there's like child sacrifice in the, in the world demonically throughout history. You know, we've seen that, the God of uh, um, Moloch, where they would beat drums, you know, to, to drown out the screaming of the children when they were being sacrificed. Um, it's it's uh, the devil wants to have a covenant with mankind, but he forces it. It's all in a forced manner. It's in a, it's in a perverted manner, in an ungodly manner. God, all his covenants are for his goodness to be poured out to mankind. And so Elohim, he wants to make a covenant with man. And Jehovah, the, word, the name Jehovah means covenant keeper. He's the one that wants to fulfill the covenant that's made, that you have. When you give your life over to Jesus Christ, it's you made a covenant with God the Father through Jesus Christ. He's the mediator between God and man. The, the Bible is broken up into two different major categories. One is the Old Testament, and the word testament is covenant. The Old Covenant and the New Covenant. And um, so God reveals his name of who he is, and Jehovah comes and says, here, I want to fulfill a covenant, all the covenants that God has with you. And it means covenant keeper, and he's grace giver. It's all unearned. You didn't, you, a covenant isn't by your work. It isn't by your duty. A covenant is always by promise. Um, and that's what we see with Abraham. 
he was the uh, he was the one that believed God, and that was accounted to him for righteousness. It was a promise made, and Abraham said, "Okay." And that was it. Now we see that we are heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ, but we are are given over then to the covenant of promise. We are, we are uh, in covenant and ha- our heirs, the Bible says, Galatians 3, remember, along with faithful Abraham. And so all the Abrahamic, or, uh, Abrahamic promises and blessings are ours. All the blessings are ours now through the promise by the Spirit of God. Then we saw El, uh, um, El Shaddai. El Shaddai, Elohim is, is a compound word, and El means strength, you know, the, the strength of God. And their, their airline, Israeli airline, is El Al, you know, meaning uh, strength of God, airline. And uh, El Shaddai, Shaddai is um, a fertile field. It also means um, all breasts. In other words, can provide for everybody and can provide any good thing. That's why the Bible says that if God did not withhold His only begotten Son, how much more will He freely give us all things? Amen? All things. He, he is El Shaddai. One minister once said he's not El Chipo. He's El Shaddai. Right? He, he, he's, he gives in a ph- phenomenal manner. He's, he's, he's overwhelming in his giving, El Shaddai. But we saw a scripture, we ended with a scripture in Revelation in the 19th chapter last time because El Shaddai isn't just what he does, you know, in goodness is in abundance. What he does in wrath is also in an abundance. It's without measure just like his goodness. So let's look at this in Revelation um, 19. But first of all, I, see, I believe in the rapture of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ before the time of tribulation. There's the wrath. It's, it, during the tribulation, it's not the wrath of man that's in the earth. It's not the wrath of the devil that's in the earth. That's now. The wrath of man are wars and rumors of wars, right? It's it's things by fear. It's terrorism. Terrorism isn't just somebody from another culture or another nation or something trying to come in and and destroy our nation. Terrorism is if you have somebody in your neighborhood that's um, breaking into homes and so you might get afraid at night. Because they're, they're breaking into houses. Terrorism. Anything that brings terror is terrorism. Anything that brings fear is terrorism. That's the, that's the wrath of Satan. He comes to bring fear. He comes to steal. He comes to kill. And he comes to destroy. The wrath of Satan is trying to get you and I to do whatever he'll do whatever he can to get us to back away from the a covenant with God. People right now and Satan it's going to get worse and worse because corruptions in this world. But we're the salt of the earth and we can keep it at bay. Just think when we're not here anymore. It's going to get so bad. For three and a half years it's just going to be terrifying. But at the end of that three and a half years, guess what? The wrath of God is going to come into this earth. And that's going to be poured out to all who refuse to obey Him. So let's look at this once. In, Gen- in Revelation 19, verse 11 through 16, it says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and makes wars. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns, and his name is written on him that no one knows but he himself. He is dressed in a robe dipped in blood. Now obviously he's talking about Jesus Christ, isn't he? And we can see the counterpart. I love that message. And one day I'll, I'll share it with you, but in Isaiah, how he's the one that he, he tramples 
in this, uh, uh, in, in the grape press, and he holds to the arbor above it to keep pressing, and nobody is there with him. And that's it. That's why the, the, the stain of the grape, the blood on his, on his life, because of what he had to do. It says he's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. And we see in John, the Gospel of John, first chapter, First, you know, verse, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God, and by Him all things were made that was made. Without Him, nothing has been, has been made except with, by Him. Amen? In Him was life, and the life was the light of man, Jesus Christ. And it says here in the 14th verse, And the armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Out of his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. Read it. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. And that word God Almighty is El Shaddai. So the abundance of blessings that we can have by yielding to God, cutting covenant with Him, accepting Jesus Christ, and then, and then living for Him, the blessings that will come are phenomenal, more than you and I can understand. Matter of fact, the Bible says, above and beyond, Ephesians 2, right, above and beyond all we could ever ask or imagine. And it'll take the eons of eternity for him to show us all of his grace and all of his goodness. But to the same measure, his wrath is going to be poured out in this earth. To the same measure. He says this, He'll rule them with an iron scepter. Out of his mouth, excuse me, comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty, El Shaddai. On his robe and on his thigh, he has his name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Basilius of Basilion and Curius of Curion. Latin or Greek words, we see that it's a counterpart, Curios of Curio is the counterpart of Adonai, owner, master, and ruler. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. Owner, master, and ruler, Adonai. Now most of the time when people think of somebody being their master or ruler, because of this corrupted world and mankind, they think of a, a, somebody just squishing them with their thumb, you know, just holding them back, mean, making their life hard, making their life miserable. But that's not God. He's a loving master and a caring master. I remember once my daughter, she was in, in high school, and my oldest, and, and she wasn't faring the best at the time and she was in, mixed up with the wrong crowd you would say and she'd go out and she had a curfew and she was uh, loyal to it she'd be home exactly at the right time and when she'd come home I'd be in prayer and when she, she'd come home and I'd say okay uh, this is who you were with this one this one this one and this is what you did fess up what do you say how do you know? She said, the Lord told me. Everything you've done, I know. Who you were with, I know. After about a couple months of that, you know, she just screamed at me. I hate you. You know everything I'm doing. See, God didn't do that to make somebody think, well, you're oppressing me. People think that. And I had to explain to her, God just wants to get his best to you. And as long as you're willing to live this self-willed life, his best will never come to you. Never. As long as your willingness to live this self-willed life, you are going to only have the best that you can do. And it's going to, even if it seems great at first, it's going to be worn down fast. See, there's a way that 
seems right unto man, but the, that way leads to death. The Bible says sin seems good for a season, but corruption, just like it is in the world, the wrath of the devil and the wrath of man. See, here we see that the wrath of God is going to be poured out one day on all that disobey, on all that say, it's my thing, I'll do what I want to do. We used to have a song back in the you know, 70s, it's your thing, do what you want to do. That's, boy, that's so far from the truth. That song in itself is demonic. Trying to get people to squander their lives away trying to get people to um, lose in life, to have the hardest life that you could imagine, to have the loneliest life that you could imagine. Satan wants to separate people and fill them with terror. See, I, I believe with all my heart that those that make Jesus Christ their Lord will never have to go through this. Because he's going to come and take his bride without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. And it's going to be before this takes place. In fact, the tribulation can't start while we're here. It's impossible. Look at what he says. In Roman, we're going to look at Romans 5, 1 Thessalonians 1, and 1 Thessalonians 5. In, 1 Thessalonians, or in Romans 5 and 9, it says that we're saved from. He uses these terms. We're saved from, we're rescued from, uh, uh, we're, we're uh, uh, delivered from. And so look at what it says in Romans 5, 9. Read it with me. How much more then, having now been justified by His blood. Isn't that the covenant that He wants us to agree with? Isn't that He wants us to say, I want that covenant with you, Lord. The one in your blood. The one in your blood. Because all good things come through the blood of Jesus Christ. Just like you, the life of your flesh is in your blood. Take away your blood, you have no life in your body. Take away the blood of Jesus and there's no goodness that man can obtain. Those that become super wealthy, the Bill Gates is the, you know, the, can't remember some of them, no, the, the, you know, anyway, whatever their names are. Uh, you know, they might, I don't know if he's a believer or not, I really, you know, I question. But without Jesus Christ, he's going to find out that all of that did nothing. That wasn't a blessing. It really, he's going to see it was a curse for him. Anything we can obtain and gain without the Lord, we lose. Jesus said this, what is it going to profit you if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Much more than having now been justified by his blood, read it, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Then it says we're rescued from 1 Thessalonians 1 and 10, read it. Wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. If we're going to be delivered from the wrath to come, does that mean we're going to go through the tribulation? That's when the wrath is poured out. It says we're going to be delivered from the wrath to come. And then it says that we're not appointed to God's wrath. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5 and 9. Read it with me. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Adonai, owner, master, and ruler. Amen? The word salvation there is uh, soteria. And what it means is it's, it's rescued and given safety. So he says we're rescued and given safety from the wrath to come. How is he going to rescue his church? 
from the wrath to come. We're going to just huddle in one corner of the earth while the rest of it burns to the ground? No, he's going to take us away. Where? To heaven, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Amen? Where the Father himself, the Bible says, is going to serve us. What a humble God we have. What a humble God. He's the one that's going to serve the wedding feast. The word salvation also means, by the way, delivered, healed, and saved. So when people think that they're sick and God made them sick, I'm not living under His wrath, are you? I'm delivered from sickness. I'm delivered from destruction. The Bible tells us He has delivered us from destruction and translated us into the kingdom of the Son of His love, Jesus Christ. And it's only by a blood covenant with Him that we can have this. So logically and biblically, how can you place the church in the time frame period of an outpouring of the wrath of God? Can you do that? No, it's impossible. So people that say, oh, we're going to go through the tribulation, and they say they're a Christian, either they're really not a Christian, or they've been sold a lie. Amen? The verse before that, or two verses before it really, when we started reading in Revelation 19, where he talked about the wrath of El Shaddai being poured out, Look at it in Revelation 19.9. Read it with me. And he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. Why would he say, Blessed are those who are called to the marriage supper of the Lamb right before he explains, Then they're gonna, the Lord's going to come with wrath in this earth. Does the Scripture say to anybody here that we're going to go through the tribulation? Believers in Jesus Christ are going to be saved from the wrath of God. Amen? He says we're going to be called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Aren't we? So God, in other words, He's saying, I'm going to have the last word on all evil. Don't worry about it. I'm going to have the last word. It's going to be... Two hits, me hitting them, them hitting the, the hell. That's it. They're just wham, that's it. Because he's Adonai. He's telling us, I want to protect you. I want to help you. I'll be your protector. I'll be the one that takes care of you. Amen? Amen? translated in the Bible. Remember I said about, the, the, in the King James Version of the Bible, the translators translated Elohim with a capital L, a capital O, a capital R, and a capital D. So when you're reading in the Old Testament, in the Old Testament only, and you come across the word, and you're reading King James, now I don't know if many people that do that anymore, but I, you know, I, that back in the day, the majority of study materials and, and Hebrew and, and Greek, you know, syntax were from, uh, with the King James Version. They coincided with King James Version. So I, I'm, I know the King James. And I love the King James. You can get a lot of revelation. But they translated correctly. They said Lord as Elohim is capital L, or excuse me, as Jehovah, I'm sorry, Yahweh, as Jehovah, is capital L, capital O, capital R, and capital D. And over 3,000 times in the Bible it's like that. About 2,500, a little over 2,500 I should say. And then when they translated the word Adonai, Lord, it's capital L, little O, little R, and little D. And this word means um, owner and master and ruler. One who owns you. 
Who purchased mankind with his blood? Jesus. And we have to accept that blood in covenant with God, don't we? And then, but he has to become our owner. I don't own me. He purchased me. He has to become my master. It's not my thing. I don't get to do what I want to do. And he has to be my ruler. That's not, I'm this, I'm this pawn that's being, uh, that's being just kicked around by this taskmaster. In no way, shape, or form is he a taskmaster. In fact, I'm going to show you today in this teaching on Adonai that literally if, you be, if he becomes your Adonai, you become his friend. Amen? Adonai is used more than 300 times in the Old Testament alone. And when we see it translated, when we see it, him talked about in the New Testament, it's kurios, owner, master, ruler. In the Greek, it's, the, it's a name that signifies ownership. And it comes from being owned by God. Now, there's an interesting facet of Adonai, just like Elohim, and that is it's both plural and possessive, just like Elohim. When you see Elohim, you, you know it, talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And when you see Adonai, you know it's talking about God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. It, comes, it confirms the fact of the triune Godhead. Now, when it's used to describe man, it's, tra it's, it's it, it, Lord, and it says Lord, it, it's translated Adon. When it's God as being the Lord, it's Adonai. When we say Lord in, in other nations, you know, they, I know that um, uh, in Spanish, in French, certain, you know, Greek, like Latin-based uh, languages, it's sir. They say senor, lord. Lord. Same word. So you can see that when you watch a movie, an old English movie, and they'll say, my lord. You know, they're not deifying them. They're just saying, yes, sir. That's all. So, in Psalms, we say, and that's very important because of a story I'm going to talk to you about, which, by the way, did I get a little secret code in Paul's message there about baptism that I got till quarter to 12 this morning? I, anyway. My, <laughs> Psalm 110. Psalm 110, first verse. Read it out loud with me. It says, The Lord said to my Lord... Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. So it says, Elohim, or here, I mean, excuse me, Yahweh, Yahweh, which is at Jehovah, or we call it, say Jehovah, English version, but it's Yahovah in, in Hebrew. But Jehovah said to Adonai, Sit at the Father's right hand until I make your enemy your footstool. The covenant keeper says, I'm, I'm out. I'm going to make this covenant work. Your church is going to be without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. They're literally, by me drawing them and working with them, they're going to know to make you the Lord, owner, master, ruler of, of their lives. And your enemy then is going to be put down under your feet. That's when he comes. Now watch. Peter, speaking on the day of Pentecost, right? He quotes this in Acts 2, verse 34 through 36. Are, are you hearing me so far this morning? Okay, this is all foundational. 
Read it with, or I'll just read it. Listen, it says, For David did not ascend into the heavens. Peter's preaching to the people that, because all, all the folks were, you know, speaking in a, a unknown languages and out on the streets. And, and um, uh, they, the religious people said, These guys are drunk. And Peter gets up boldly and preaches a message, right? He says, that, This is that which was spoken uh, by Joel in the last day. I'll pour out of my spirit upon all flesh. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. And and it says here, it says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says to him, he says himself, The Lord said to my Lord, because they taught, they thought it was David that was saying, Lord, I'm, my kingdom is going to make all this happen. That's why they wanted the kingdom of David to come back. They were waiting for this lineage of David to come. But he's telling them, David didn't ascend into the heavens. But he says himself, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. In other words, Jehovah said to Adonai, you sit at the right hand of the Father till I make your enemies your footstool. Look at the 36th verse. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. And the word Lord there is kurios. It's the same definition of kurios as just a Greek counterpart to the Hebrew name Adonai, owner, master, ruler. God has made Jesus owner, master, and ruler. And where is he seated now? At the right hand of the Father, isn't he? We say even religious circles say that. Yeah, he ascended to the right hand of the Father. He ascended to the right. He's Adonai. Waiting till his enemies are made his footstool. Well, what about ruling in the church then? Remember, it's the, Jesus there, but the Holy Spirit is the one now ruling in the church. What about churches that say, we don't want the Holy Spirit here? You can talk about Jesus, but we don't want the Holy Spirit. We don't like that stuff. Miracles there passed away. Nobody's supposed to speak in tongues anymore. Uh, you can't prophesy. And the Bible's clear, don't despise prophesying. Paul, it, the Bible says, I wish everyone would pray in tongues, would speak in tongues. We need the Holy Spirit. Why? Look at what it says. 2 Corinthians 3, 5 through 17. But even to this day, when Moses is read, or the old covenant, a veil lies on, on their heart. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, kurios, owner, master, and ruler, the veil is taken away. Now the Lord, the Lord is the Spirit. The word kurios means supreme in authority. Get this. Here's a trend. The word means controller. He says what to do, when to do it. He says how to do it. Who does? Now the Lord. Now. When? Now the Lord is the Spirit. Capital S, the Spirit of God. So among us, who's Lord here? The Holy Spirit. Is Jesus Christ Lord? Yes, He's seated at the right hand of the Father. And guess what then? The Father's Lord. Amen? Amen? So he says again, he says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is what? Liberty. He's not a taskmaster. He's not one pushing anyone down, holding anyone back, not one, you know, uh, uh, like my daughter just thought, well, I'm, you're keeping me from what I want to do, but I'm, keep, I'm trying to save you from a, a terrible, terrible life. Trying to bring you into a place where all the goodness of God is poured out to you. And whatever you think, I told I said, it didn't matter what you think, I love you. I love you. You might not think it's love because you are carnal. Some people, to, when, when God is going to be dealing with folks, listen, they, I, I just can't handle this. I, how can I give my life to a God that's just so hard? He loves you. He wants you to have the best life that you could possibly have. Above and beyond what you could ask or imagine. 
But you have to first lay your life down to see that. We'll see it in scriptures. So Lord, kurios, Lord, Master, Supreme in Authority, Controller. When you see, by the way, in, in, it's a dawn when you see Lord for a person in the, in the Old Testament. It's just the, it's little L, little O, little R, little D. Well, it's kurios, right, for Lord, uh, God being Lord in the, in the Greek, but it's kurion when it means uh, person. When it's talking about, you know, man, uh, kind. Now let's look at a picture of Jesus being Savior and Lord, right? In Exodus, the 21st chapter, the first four verses, it says this. Now these are the judgments which you shall set before them. If you buy a Hebrew servant, he shall serve six years. Yeah, it did say when you buy, if you buy a Hebrew servant, he'll serve you for six years. And in the seventh year, he'll go free and pay nothing. If he comes in by himself, he'll go out by himself. If he comes in married, then his wife will go out with him. If his master, though, gives him a wife, and she even has children, sons and daughters, the wife and her children are going to be the masters. And he's going to go out by himself. Church at Corinth was told, if you are married to an unbeliever, if they want to go, let them go. If they want to go out from lordship, from serving, let them go. So he says this. If his master has given him wife, she shall be our sons and daughters, children, the master, he shall or and wife and her children shall be her masters. See, I'm, let me do this again, fourth verse. If his master has given him a wife and she has borne him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself if he wants to go. So we see the Israelites allowed. It, it, uh, kind of slavery on a limited basis, right? Somebody that they're not doing well at all. They can't provide for themselves, or maybe they have wife and kids at the time and they can't provide for them, and it's possible starvation. What they would do is they would go to a Hebrew family that, that is well off and they would say, we'll serve you for six years if you take care of us. And at the end of that six years, the, the, the master would be, the owner would then let them go with, uh, with, with uh, finances and, and clothes and things that they'd be able to take care of themselves for a time. But while they were there, the, the owner would, and that was their, pur their purchasing, you're, but it wasn't just at the end of six years. You don't starve for six years and then, and then go out, you know, and here, we'll give you money now. No, he provided for them. He protected them. He clothed them. He paid for any medical, did, took care of any medical they needed. Whatever it was, he protected them against uh, thieves and robbers. And, the, and he was there. They were his and people knew that. He was responsible for all of their affairs, everything. But they had to obey him. They had to do what he told them to do. How he told them to do it. They might have figured it had their own way, but it didn't mean nothing. Then they weren't going to receive anything. He, they had to just do what he said. Isn't that your way on the job, right? They say, I'll give you whatever you're making out there, 30 bucks an hour, whatever it is. And, um, but you've got to do what we tell you to do. How we tell you to do it. Right? If, if you on your job did not do what they told you to do, and then when they did tell you to do something, you didn't, tell, they didn't, you didn't do it how they wanted you to do it, you did it your own way, how long would you keep that job? Not long. What about God? 
Is this, is this master in Israel, is he going to say, yeah, I guess they can just slough off and do their own thing. I guess I'm stuck with them now for six years. No. If that's what you want to do, that's what got you in this trouble, go. Right? But, now, if the master provided a wife and children that were born to him, they could, the guy could leave for free, but he'd have to leave the woman and the children if he wanted to go. But now, what did this symbolize? They were saying, I'm a slave by choice. I came here and I cho chose this route because I couldn't deal with my own life. That's the same as a picture of somebody giving their life to Jesus as Savior. Right? The Savior. Remember, the Bible says Jesus now is both Savior and Lord. But this, that's Savior. You, they, you saved me. Because I wasn't dealing with my life right. Man, I, I was lonely. I was afraid. I mean, it, it looked good even out here, maybe. People with money. You notice that there's a lot of people with money kill themselves. And that's because of what's going on inside that they can't deal with. They don't have the strength. They don't have the understanding. They don't have the wherewithal. Jesus will save them from that. Amen? Jesus will save anyone from anything. You just go to them. Yeah, come on. But after that, if you want to go free, you're on your own. You have to make Him, not just Savior, you have to make Him Adonai, Lord. And listen what these scriptures say now. Let's go on. In Exodus, in the 21st chapter, and look at verse 5 and 6. It says this, If the servant plainly says, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I'll not go out free. Then his master will bring him to the judges and he'll also bring him to the door and to the doorpost and his master shall pierce his ear with an awl and he shall serve him, how long? Forever. And this is a picture of the church, of people coming to Christ. Yeah, we can, I'll give my life to the Lord. He saved me from this. You know, I was full of fear. I was a drug addict. I was an alcoholic. Saved me from all that. Delivered. But, He's saying, are you willing to make me Lord? You can go out free. You can do whatever you want to do. And there's a lot of people in the church saying that. That's what grace means, they preach. You can do whatever you want to do. It's not what the Bible teaches. But that's still a choice. You've got to come to the place of saying, I'm going to live for Jesus. I don't want to go out. I don't want to do my thing. I want to serve Him. Now there's a change that takes place. Something happens here. This person called, it's called a bondservant. A bondservant. In the Greek, it's daulos. Same word, bondservant. And what we see here is this, this person is being provided for by God. He's being taken care of by God. Yeah, I got some ideas. I got some things that I would really want to do. But I got to learn to say, Holy Spirit, what do you want? What do you need? I'm here to serve you, not me. And do you know something? If we will do that, do you think that the Master's going to say, you're just out all your life then? You're just under my thumb. You're just going to work, work, work for me and that's it. No! He's gonna, didn't He provide in the first place? Deliverance, health, took care of you, fed you. How much more then will He freely give you? Amen? Jesus came to the earth and he didn't sin. He could have. Right? I mean, he could have. But he didn't because he came to do... Didn't he say, I come to do thy will, O Lord? It's written of me in the volumes of writings. 
I just come to do your will, Father. That's it. Look at it in Luke 22. Verse 42 through 44, here's Jesus. He's praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. He has to die on the cross. He has to be beaten. He has to be whipped. All the meat and flesh off of his back, from the back of his head to his ankles. Everything ripped, torn. He, had to, he, had to, he was forced to carry his own cross. And then he was going to be nailed to a cross and die a torturous, humiliating death of a criminal. And look at what he says. Father, if it's your will, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, what? Not my will, but yours be done. Then the angel appeared unto him from heaven, strengthening him. When? When he said, Father, I give up my will. This is what I want. I would, I, right now, under these circumstances, this is the way I see it. Bail me out. But, whatever you want, Father, I want to do your will. And an angel came and strengthened him. And he being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat became like drops of blood falling down to the ground. Adonai is is the God who totally owns people. Totally owns people. He protects them, provides for them, keeps them healthy, deals with all the things that come at us through a corrupted, fallen world. Adonai. He protects us. He guards us. He shows us the way to go. He tells us what to do, how to do it, even if I don't know why. It doesn't really matter. It's just what He wants. And man, does He come through. Amen? When Jesus prayed, not my will, Father, but Yours be done, He was saying, I'm more than just a servant in this world. I'm a bond slave. I'm doing it by choice. The first time you give your life over to Christ, you have no other choice. Right? You're the end of your rope. You're the end of you. That's it. I'm giving my life to Jesus. But everyone comes to that place then where you have to make this decision on your own now. When I gave you good things. When life seems good. When everything's all right. You have an abundance now. Your health is great now. You have inner peace now. You're strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. But I'm asking you to lay down your will. And there's where we have to say yes to the Lordship of Christ. Otherwise, He's just Savior. We get to know Him as owner, master, and ruler. We get to find out what He really wants to give to people. How He really wants to bless people. How He really wants to use us with signs and wonders and miracles and healings and empowerments. Look at in Philippians 2, 9-11. through You know, some people cringe again because of the giving God my all my will. I can't let them have complete ownership. Well, one thing is they've conformed to the world's way of thinking, saying, I'm my own person, you know, I'm a free spirit, mom, that's me. Well, they don't realize that God's being good to us. A lot of times people think, well, I'm doing okay up until now. Jesus says, when everyone says peace and safety, then sudden destruction will come. When everyone says, yeah, it's good, it's okay, sudden destruction. You've been purchased with an expensive, expensive price. The most expensive of all, the blood of Jesus Christ. And the only way to be free 
is yielding freely your life to Adonai. And allowing the Holy Spirit to come and direct your life in every way. Whether you understand it or not. Because where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's where liberty is. There's where real freedom is. Because Jesus humbled himself as a bondservant. Look at Philippians 2, 9 through 11. It says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, those in heaven and those on earth, and those under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Is the enemy going to be crushed under Jesus' feet, Adonai's feet? Of course. He said, Father, I don't want this, but if this is what you want, let's do it. He gave his will over. It's the way for us too. 1 Corinthians 7.22, look it. Read it out loud with me. For he that is called to the Lord, being a servant, is the Lord's free man. The word for Lord here again is kurios, owner and master and ruler. For he that is called in the owner, master and ruler. The one that's given over that way is a daulos, a bond servant of the Lord's free man. John 15, I was in my sleep last night. The Lord's talking to me about some of this stuff. And he shared with me, uh, brought to my remembrance of John 15, 13 and 14, where Jesus says, greater love is no one than this, that a man would lay down his life for a friend. You're my friend if you do whatever I command you. See, that guy that gave his life to the, Israel, uh, you know, the Hebrew master, he was just a servant until he could go free. And when he says, I'm not going to go free, I'm going to just serve you on my own. Here's a, here, I'm just gonna, this is it. I'm giving up my will. I'm going to, for the rest of my life, just serve you. He became that master's friend. Isn't that what everyone wants? Somebody that just... You know, even, even corrupted in the world. Your best friend was always somebody that just go along with you no matter what. The friend that'd say, wait a minute now, you want to do that? And this? And then that? Man, that's dangerous. What time? You know? <laughs> we don't mind in the world and we laugh about it and say, yeah, that's fun. Boy, look at that. But when it comes to God, why is it so hard for somebody to give up their will? When God, is, there's no destruction in it. There's no issues with it. There's no uh, uh, corruption with it. There's only elevating. There's only promoting. There's only blessing. Amen? Amen? God spoke to Job. Oh, listen. In, in, we said already, but 2 Corinthians 3.17, it says, now, where the, now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the sport, Lord is, there is liberty. Listen to what God spoke to Job. He says, to man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and depart from evil is understanding. To respect the Lord and give Him total ownership of your life is the wisest thing you could ever do. Ever. We're living in a time that's short. This period of grace is so, so minute right now. To where the church, the salt of the earth, is going to be snatched away. Listen, this world's corruption... For three and a half years, people are just, it's going to be insane. But that's nothing to compare to the wrath of God. You say, well, I'm good then. He's coming for the faithful. He's coming for the faithful. That's why he's been talking to you even before this. The Holy Spirit has been dealing with everybody in here, in your heart, to repent. He's been dealing with every single one of you. You stop doing that. 
or I need you to do this. But most of you just pushed it into the back of your mind thinking, one day I'll get to it. One day it'll happen. Today's the day, now is the acceptable time. You don't know what this today holds. He needs your will. He needs you to surrender and serve Him. He's Adonai. The Apostle Paul was a bondservant, and to him it was a title of honor. In Romans 1.1, read it. Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God. Was the title, was the title of honor an apostle? No, it was bondservant. James, his half-brother, he, 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 it was a title of honor for him. James 1.1, 1, 1, read it. James, a bondservant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. James didn't even believe that he was the Savior at first. He didn't believe in Jesus. He, re, he took off on Jesus. He didn't want nothing to do with him. He thought Jesus was a nut. But he came to the place of yielding his total will over. Peter, that was a title of honor to Peter. Look at 2 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, Simon Peter, a bondservant and apostle of Jesus Christ. Bondservant was their great title because that's what made them be a friend to God. Jesus says, no greater love is a man than this than a man would lay down his life for his friends. You're my friend if you do what I tell you to do. If you lay your will down and trust me and I'll do for you abundantly above and beyond all you could ever ask or imagine. I'll bless you beyond what you could even think about. I'll help you in ways that you would never ever figure it out. Because I would be your total master. You can receive Jesus as Savior and still not make Him the master of your life. In the book of Judges, Israel is backslidden condition. God promised. You know, all the promises of Israel, they had none. For seven years, the Midianites controlled them. They were terrible. They burned all their crops and fields. They killed even women and children. They tormented them ruthlessly, constantly. The Israelites had to dig holes and hide in them and live in holes in the ground. Some of them lived in caves. God sent a prophet to Israel in Judges 6 and 10, and he said, I am the Lord your God. Do not fear the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. Why was it that they were in such bondage? Why is it that the United States is coming into a place of such bondage? Disobedience. You know, I kind of criticize the saying, God, America is not going to be great again. The mantra of those that follow Donald Trump, whether you do or not, doesn't really matter to me. I am not a political man. Amen. But America will never be great again. Not this way. And they say, well, you, you're just a prophet of doom and gloom then. You're not in faith, somebody said. Wait a minute. Jesus himself, when they were bragging about the temple, said, look at this great temple, Jesus. He said, no, it's all going to be torn down and burned. They didn't say, you're not a man of faith, Jesus. No, he wanted it torn down so he could come and build a new temple made without hands. America isn't to be great again. We're holding back the evil pretty good. We need to better. How are we going to do that? By yielding our will to God. Our wills. 
But how is it going to happen? Jesus is going to come back, renew everything, and rule and reign as the Prince of Peace for a thousand years. It'll be greater than America has ever been all over the world. Amen? Quit trying to rebuild the old and have a mind to work with Jesus to build the new. Amen? One day a man named Gideon he was going about his business, and an angel of the Lord came to him. In fact, he's threshing wheat in a, in a, in a, a wine press, hiding, so the Midianites didn't steal a little bit of food that they had. And listen to this in, in Judges, and um, the sixth chapter. And the 11th through the 12th verse. Now the angel of the Lord came and sat under the oak tree, which is an Aphra, which belonged to Joash the Abizrite, while his son Gideon threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said to him, oh, The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Amen. Now, this, this uh, Joash, by the way, he was the leading citizen in this community. He was the head guy. And his son was supposed to be um, uh, a great, you know, a, a protege. And an angel came and says, you're a mighty man of valor. He's hiding. He's cowering. He was put down for seven years. Knowing his place in society under Judaism, he still, he couldn't believe it. Gideon said to him in the 6th chapter in the 13th verse, Oh my Lord, look at this little L. He's calling him Adon. He knew that there were, he, it was, it's an angel, it's somebody special here. But it was nothing to do with God. He said, Adon, my owner, master, ruler, if the Lord Jehovah is with us, then why is all this stuff happening to us? Where are all the miracles where, which our fathers told us about, saying, didn't the Lord Jehovah bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord Jehovah has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianite. All God's wanting was somebody to say, I'm going to make you, Lord, Adonai, capital L, little O, little R, little D. And everything would be dealt with. But nobody would. They didn't see God that way. All they said was, we, we, Jehovah, we knew, Savior. How come you're not saving us? Remember when Jesus came to the earth? That was the, 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 the mantra of the, of the Israelites during that time. I thought you're, if you're Messiah, you're supposed to be saving us from, uh, the, uh, from uh, uh, the, uh, Rome. He says, no, I'm building a kingdom you don't understand. He just wanted people to give their wills over to him so he could do something. And he found one. This is what God was looking for here. Gideon said the words that needed to be said, older master, ruler, but he didn't say, I don't know. Then the angel said to Gideon, listen, Judges 6, 14 through 50, go in this thy might. In other words, just go in, in your might. Go in what you got here. Yeah, I am a Lord to you. Remember on Jesus' hip, he's a king of kings. Basilius, Bas Basilius of Basilion and the Curius of Curion. He's the king of kings and lord of lords. We're, we're lords. This angel was, go in this thy might, he said. And you shall save Israel from the hands of the Midianites. Have not I sent you? So he said to him, now, O oh my Adonai. He changed, he's calling them, come on. Go in this might that you just understand ownership, mastership, rulership. Do this, use this mentality. And so he's toward God. And he did, he says, my Lord, Adonai, how can I save Israel? He's still weak, he still doesn't understand. He's still pushed down for seven years of terrorism. Seven years of bondage. 
How can I save Israel? Indeed, my clan is the weakest in Manasseh, and I'm the least in my father's house. Gideon had a poor self-image. But the Lord was about to turn things around. My image doesn't mean anything to God. Gideon's image didn't mean anything to God. All he had to do was recognize that he's my master. Judges 6, 16 through 18. And the Lord said to him, Surely I'll be with you, and you shall defeat the Midianites as one man. Then he said to him, If now I have found favor in your sight, show me a sign that it is you who talks with me. And the angel agrees, so Gideon prepares a sacrifice. He presents it, and the angel gives him direction in 6, 20-22. The angel said, take meat and unleavened bread, lay them on a rock, and pour out some broth. And he did so, and the angel of the Lord put his end of the staff in his hand, touched the meat and unleavened bread, fire rose out of the rock, consumed the meat and the unleavened bread, and the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight. Now Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, so Gideon Gideon, he was afraid for his life. He thought he was going to die. He says, Alas, O Lord God, Adonai. In other words, I have seen the angel of the Lord face to face. In in other words, it was a declaration of his death. He knew, he thought God was this taskmaster. This hard being because they weren't delivered from the problems. And God was trying to get them. You just have to accept me as owner, master, and ruler, and you'll see my power towards you. Judges 6, 23 through 24. The Lord said to him, Peace be with you. Do not fear. You shall not die. So Gideon built an altar there and called it, The Lord is Peace. To this day, it's still an Oprah of Abiezerite, which we're going to talk about in a couple Sundays down the road. But Jehovah Shalom. He was introduced. It's, you have peace with God. You don't, have to, you don't have to be afraid of him, but you have to honor him, fear him in honor, not afraid. And you know the rest of the story, right? Gideon, he goes and tears down the Ashtaroth or the totem poles that they were worshiping Satan and their gods. And um, they, they tore him down and he built an altar to the Lord. People get up the next morning and they said, who wrecked all of our shrines? Who wrecked all of our altars? And, and somebody said, it was Gideon. And so they're saying, let's kill him. And so they all go after Gideon. And the Lord says, now's a good time. Set up a recruiting station and recruit an army out of these misfits. And he got 32,000 people, men, to give their, say, okay, we'll fight with you, Gideon. And of the 32,000, the Lord says, you know what? Well, let's do this different. Tell whoever's afraid to go home. 22,000 goes home. There, I'm sure they're thinking, now you got a good idea, Gideon. And they left. They went home. He ends up with 10,000 men. And that wasn't enough. The Lord keeps giving them direction. Are you really giving your will over to me? Are you really going to do what I'm telling you to do? He said, tell them to go to this pond over here and everyone take a drink. Everyone that just sticks their head in the pond and drinks, send them home. But everyone that picks up the water in their hands and drinks out of their hands, keep them. 9,700 men go home. 300 against an army of a quarter of a million plus trained soldiers. And the Lord says, now take a horn. Everyone take a trumpet. Take a, take a, 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 a vase and, and put a candle in it. And surround them. Break yourself up into a company of three. So three squads of a hundred each. And surround them. And then break this. The, when I tell you to, break that, uh, um, uh, that vase. Let the candle glow to show your face to the enemy. And blow your horn. And when they did, the enemy turned on each other screaming. Oh, you, that, the, Gideon. Uh, everyone have, had to holler out. It's the, the sword of the Lord and Gideon. And as soon as they did, the enemy turned on each other and killed each other. Owner, master, ruler. 
When, when Jesus is our Savior, we got to figure out everything on our own. We got to know how it's going, why it's going. You got to, you, you got to convince me. I got to calculate this. And if it's not the way I think, forget you. But when Jesus is Adonai, owner, master, ruler, when the Holy Spirit is really telling you what to do and you're doing it no matter what, the enemy is going to turn and destroy himself. God will provide for you. He'll help you. He'll care for you. Amen? God wanted to show Gideon, Israel, and us a master who protects us. And then the Lord gives Gideon one final instruction. And that was it, the trumpets. We won't have to read it. The Midianites, listen, what they turn on each other. I, I've been before, you know, on nightly news about, I, at one time we were being sued by our neighbors over here of adverse possession of our property, sued by the gay lesbian rights organization, and sued because we, weren't, we said the thing was, was uh, um, they wanted to know if there was any jobs available here. We said, there's no jobs available. And they said, well, we want to work in the kitchen. There's no jobs available. They said, well, we're, we're gay. And they said, there's no jobs available. Well, they were suing us, saying that it was discrimination against uh, some person that's gay. And then we were being sued by the Buddhists for fraudulent conversion. A girl down the road gave her life to Jesus after coming to church here for four months, got water baptized during our picnic, went home. They said, man, you were swimming. We told you, you know, don't, don't go to the water by yourself down by the river. I said, no, I got baptized. I gave my life to the Lord, got baptized over here with the New Testament church. So they were suing us three different, I was on the nightly news for three months. Our attorney, I did an interview and just, it was great. I shared Jesus. I talked about the Lord and his goodness. And I had our attorneys, you know, called from our insurance company and said, Dr. Holman, you got to stop it. You can't, don't say anything. I said, listen, I'll do my job. You do yours. You just don't want to do your job. Not afraid of people. I'm doing what the Lord asked. And every one of those cases were dropped within a week. Is Jesus your Savior? If not, He can be. And to you, that He's your Savior, more importantly then, is He your Lord? When Jesus talked to the church, or when Paul would write letters to the church at Ephesus, He says, to the saints and to the faithful. The saints, you got saved. Praise the Lord, brother, sister, we're in the family of God. But can God use you? Can he accomplish what he's supposed to be doing through you, with you? Do you give, are you giving him permission? Are you faithful? We're having a baptism today. It's kind of significant. It signifies that we're dying when we water baptize. We're, we're signifying I'm dying to myself. And I'm coming up to live only for the Lord. That's what a water baptism is. Adonai. You know him as Jehovah. Get to know him as Adonai you'll find out that He has greater plans than you can imagine. And your life, oh, well, sometimes it won't be easy. You have, your mind always wants to, you know, try to figure things out, but you just got to do what He tells you to do. Say what He tells you to say. Jesus, when He came, He said, I only say what I hear my Father say, and I only do what I see Him do. That's it. That's what He's wanting of His church in this last day. He said he'd come to build his church. If you're not in, with him in building his church, then you're not really living for the Lord. 
Like I told you once, we're not on a cruise ship on the Lido deck, you know, sucking on a lemonade and laying in the sun. We're on a battleship and it's all hands on deck. Why don't we stand up together? Did you get something out of this? Thank you. Three people. That's great. (laughs) Praise the Lord. God can take three people and save the world. Amen. Amen. Why don't we pray this prayer of commitment together? Say it out loud. Dear Heavenly Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I call him the Lord of my life. Jesus, you take over and you direct my life. I'm your bond servant. And I do what you tell me to do. And I'm going to stop doing what you don't want me to do. You're my master. Praise you, Jesus. Adonai, Lord. And in Jesus' name, everyone said, Amen Amen and Amen. Give the Lord a hand of praise and honor.